Uh, we've been looking at this topic, so what if Jesus asked you? It's kind of like uh, in the Gospels, there are all these questions that Jesus asked, and uh, we've been uh, taking some of them, but not all of them, and been focusing on them. And one of the key questions that Jesus asked is, where are your accusers? Every now and then, we mess up. Well, I should say, I mess up. I don't know, maybe you don't mess up. Anybody here who hasn't messed up lately? <laughs> no hands are going, okay, every now and then. And the worst part is when somebody then comes along and points that out to you, right? Oh, you really messed up. I mean, that just makes your day, doesn't it? Well, really not. No, 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 it doesn't. Well, today I, I want to talk about this whole I idea. In the passage that we're looking at, it, it's a pretty famous passage. Uh, it does not occur at this location in all manuscripts. In some manuscripts, it's in an entirely different gospel. Others in places in, in the gospels. But uh, it's included, and very few people doubt that this is truly a uh, part of what Jesus uh, actually said and did. And so I'm going I'm to dive into this today. Uh, in, our, in our passage in John chapter 8, uh, there are certain people who are involved. Now, below, when you dig deeper in this passage, you realize that there's a surface lesson, and then there are several things much deeper than that. There's a political struggle going on. Do we have political struggles today? Oh, no, no, not at all. Uh, yeah. There are huge political power struggles. That's going on underneath the surface. So I could look at it politically. There's an emotional struggle going on between the guilty and the innocent, the accuser and the accused. There's this emotional struggle going on. Uh, as you read through the passage, we could, we could take and look at it from a theological struggle that's going on in this passage. And there's certain people in the passage, and let's begin with that. The first one is the teacher. The teacher is Jesus. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach him. So Jesus is in the temple. He's in the temple complex, and he's teaching. And while the teaching is going on, we have the lawyers and the Pharisees. Anytime somebody shows up with their lawyer, you probably think something is going to go down here. <laughs> the lawyers. The word lawyer just means that these were the experts in the law, the Mosaic law, the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, you know that the Ten Commandments are in there. Well, if you read the next chapter, it's like 40 more commandments. And if you were like the guy Maimonides back in, the, I think it was the 14th century, uh, he went through the, the, the whole first five books of the Bible and he counted every command and prohibition and he came up with 613. And so these guys were the experts on the 613 rules of the Bible, of the Old Testament, the Torah, the law. And the Pharisees were your right-wingers. They were extremist right-wingers. And they, you got on the one side, on the right wing, okay, you got the, the Pharisees. Now, completely on the other end of the spectrum, you got the Sadducees. So they're the left-wingers, okay? Right-wingers left-wingers. Somebody said they're called, they were sad, you see. That's why they're called sad, you see. No, that's not really true. But you have, have right-wingers, left-wingers, and both have their lawyers. It's just like today's politics. Politics, but, but you've got to realize that religion and politics are mixed in the day of Jesus. The high priest is more than just a priestly figure. He's a political figure. He's got political power. There's a group called the Sanhedrin, the 70 in Jerusalem, that are the leaders. These 70 people, uh, many were Pharisees. Uh, they were the ruling class, and, and they were the lay between, liaison between uh, the nation Israel and the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire dominated. And so there's, there's political maneuvering constantly going on, kind of like in Washington, D.C. Actually, Jerusalem was kind of like a swamp, just like Washington, D.C., politically at this time. You do know that in the very end, they get Jesus on trumped-up charges. You do know that. Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up again. That is the charge that they bring against him. Only they twist what he said, because he's talking about, you kill me, and three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. 
And they twisted it say, he said he'll destroy the temple and three days later he'll raise the temple up from the temple. That's blasphemy. So they accused him and they tried him on trumped up false charges and they crucified the Lord of glory. There's a bunch of politics going on here and it's underneath what's going on in our text today. The teachers and the law. So you got the teacher, Jesus. You got then the, the teachers of the law, the lawyers and the Pharisees. Now, the next person we have here is the adulterous woman. Here is a woman that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought. They brought her in into the midst to sit, to actually stand before everybody, all these, these people around her. A woman caught in adultery. She's guilty. Caught red-handed. Everyone who reads this passage scratches their head and they say, where is the man? Hmm. So we find that there is a political gender bias here against women. And what we find here in this text is this woman, she's caught, but she couldn't have done this by herself. But where's the guy? Where's the other guilty party? They're able to take advantage of her, but they don't take advantage of him. You think that's a little unjust? I think so. Do we still have injustice today? Absolutely we do. There is nothing new and nothing old. Sin is sin, wrong is wrong, right is right, all, all the way through the ages. So we got, we got the people. We got the teacher, we got the accusers, and we got the accused. And the poor woman there, she is. She's in the midst of all the group. Now there's a trap going on. That's why I said that this passage has a political motivation going on underneath it, everything that's going on. The trap. And to have a trap, you have to have some bait, something which the, the one that you're wanting to trap will go after. And so in this case, they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. She's the bait. They're using her. I want to say they're abusing her. If they had brought the man too, he could have then said, these two, but they only brought the one they're using her. She's a pawn, a part, a piece of what they want to do to trap Jesus. She's just the bait in the story. Now, every trap, you got the bait, but there's some kind of trigger or spring or something. So when you hit that, boom, it comes and it grabs you and you're caught. And so the trigger here is they're using the Bible, the law. You know, you can misuse your Bible. Some people use this method of determining God's will for their life. They open up and say, Lord, I need to know what you want me to do today. And they open it up and psh, Oh, the pastor said, Judas went out and hung himself. Oh, I don't like that. They close it. Lord, I really know what you want me to do today. They open up your Bible and psh, Go do thou likewise. Oh man, they don't like that. They close your Bible one more time. Lord, what really want me to do today? They open up the Bible. What thou dost do quickly. Now listen, that's not Bible study. That's not the way you determine the will of God. That's abusing the Bible like it's some hocus pocus machine. They were abusing the law. And the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? You say, there's nothing wrong with that question. That's a good theological question. Why wouldn't they ask that question? They, here she was, she's guilty party. The next part tells us why this is so wrong. They're abusing their Bible. They were using this question to trap Jesus. In order to have a basis to accuse him. Politicians do this to this very day. They make up lies, accuse people that are not true. They spend millions of dollars trying to defend themselves. It comes out that they're cleared and all that time and that way. So it still happens today. It's a trap. It's a trap. Set up a trap in order to have a basis to accuse Jesus. You say, well, what do you mean have a basis of him? All right, listen. Here's how the trap goes. If Jesus says, stone her, he keeps the Mosaic law. He's answered correctly. But at the same time, if he says stone her, he breaks the Roman law. Because the Roman law says you don't stone anyone. You don't have the authority to do that. The Roman Empire doesn't stone people. The Roman Empire crucifies people. 
So if he answers it the way they want him to answer it, they're going to say, aha, you're guilty of violating Roman law. See, they got him. On the other hand, if Jesus doesn't say stone her, and he keeps the Roman law, at that moment, he's breaking the Mosaic law. It's one of those, ah, I gotcha moments. I gotcha. Darned if you do, darned if you don't. You ever been there? Usually it's, uh, if, I, if I say yes, I'm in big trouble. If I say no, I'm in big trouble. It's one of those moments. Jesus is there. They got him in his crosshairs. They got Jesus. That's what they're thinking. It's at this moment Jesus does something really interesting. You know, the Bible tells us this is the only thing Jesus wrote. He never wrote a book. And yet there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of books written about him. Jesus then bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. I do not know what he wrote. No one knows what he wrote. Everyone wishes they, knew, they had a knowledge of what he wrote. Tradition tells us he started writing some names. Think about it for a moment. The Bible doesn't tell us this. This is just pure speculation from tradition through the ages. Jesus started writing names down. I don't know. Maybe one of them had one of those unusual names like Isaiah, son, Mahershala, Hashbaz. That would have been a lot of writing. Let's pick a shorter one. Malachi. Another guy's name. He's writing, he's writing something on the ground. Soon as he finishes writing with his finger, the Bible tells us, while he was writing down there, writing, they were badgering him. Come on, Jesus, answer the question. Come on, you think you know everything. It's a simple question. Answer it. You see what I'm going on? You, you've seen it where people badger, and he just keeps writing. I'm just going to assume tradition is right here. Name after name after name. Tells them they just kept badgering him to answer the question, and then he straightens up, and he turns to them, and he says, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. You gotta feel if you're the gal. That really didn't clear you much. One of these guys might think he's sinless. He might throw a stone at me and nail me really good, and then the rest will join right in. I mean, this is like a scary moment in her life. You see, I'm not dealing with this from the emotional element, but can you imagine the dread and the fear of the accused at that moment? Caught guilty? Being told to throw the stones? With one condition, if you were without sin? After Jesus said that, he simply stooped down and he began to write again on the ground. It's at this point, use your mind just a little bit, imagination, because the text doesn't tell us what he wrote. But he's got the names, and I think the names may have been, if they were the names, it's what he wrote, of each of one of the accusers standing in that circle. And right next to him, he began to write either another name, Mary, and the oldest one realizing, oh, he knows what I did to Mary. He drops his stone. He writes next to the next one, oh, Sabbath day. <laughs> the guy that had been out golfing on the Sabbath day realized that he broke the Sabbath. <laughs> he drops his stone. I don't know, maybe honor your mother and father. And the guy that had gone into the temple and pronounced his offering, korban, means dedicated to God, and then didn't put it in and took it home, and that money, he said, oh, I can't use it to support my parents because it's been dedicated to God. He didn't do the tithe the way the tithe was. You see, the tithe was originally set up that you give 10% to God, and at one point where you have to take care of your parents, you direct that money instead of to God, to your parents. If you had 10 kids, you had 100% income in your Social Security life. God's Social Security exists above the Bible. That's why you wanted a big family. Big family pumps a lot of money into your Social Security system. 
but he knows he's withholding from his, he drops his stone, he broke the law. And Jesus, I think what he's doing there is he just, right after name after name, he's just listing, and he gets done, he gets to the last name, he, he's finally done going down through the commandments and the 613 commands, and name, and what name, and he stands back up. At this he said, those who had begun to go away one at a time, the, old, the oldest one first, until only Jesus was left there with the woman, standing there. You realize what's going on here? Theologically, he is the only one who could stone her. He is the only one without sin. We celebrate Christmas. Every year at Christmas, Jesus Christ's birth, we talk about having a virgin conception so that Jesus was supernaturally conceived through the work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Mary so that she was without sin. She had a holy child, completely holy, no sin. He knew no sin. He did no sin. He's sinless. Peter tells us he's the innocent, sinless Lamb of God. Everywhere we look, we find it. Paul's writings, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus Christ knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The only sinless person in the world is standing there eye to eye. With this woman who has been found guilty, she's in shame, and all of her accusers are now gone, and she's standing there with the only holy person on the planet. And here comes the big question. Jesus straightened up, and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Where are they? Where did they all go? Has no one condemned you? I summarize this at the beginning with the question, Where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? The only one who could really bring condemnation and cast the first stone was Jesus. And he's saying, where are all those who are bringing condemnation against you? Where are all those who are accusing you? And she says, uh, uh, no one is here, sir. No one. No one, they're gone. Jesus then says these words, neither do I condemn you. She was guilty. She was guilty. But Jesus is not condemning her. He's not condemning her. He does make a charge against her, though. He says this. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, he doesn't say, he doesn't say, oh, it's okay what you've done. No, he says, what you've done is sinful. Now you are to go and leave the sin of adultery. The sin of, though you're married, you slept with another man, that's adultery. If it had been that she was not married, slept with another man, it would have been fornication. What he's talking about is sexual sins. But I'm telling you, in this passage, you could put any sin in that spot. Jesus would be saying, go now, leave your life of sin. Repent. Turn away from that. Turn to the true and living God. Repent. Repent. What a contrast in this passage. I find this a huge contrast. It's like the world in which we live. The Pharisees and the lawyers, they took her captive. They sought her out, waited for the opportune moment, captured her, hauled her before Jesus. On the other side, Jesus sets her free. Jesus sets her free. On the one side, they despised her. She is just a sinful, low-life woman caught in the act. Jesus loves her. He loves her. Jesus loves sinners. It's a good thing because we all are one. He loves sinners. They abused her. They were using her as a little pawn. They didn't care about what she was feeling, what she was going through, the pain, the brokenness in her life, all that had gone down. Hey, 
something was going on in her life that drove her away from her husband and to someone else, all of that pain, all of that, they didn't care one bit about her. She was just a tool so they could pull off their plan to try to bring Jesus down. But what does Jesus do? He releases her from all of that. He scatters all her accusers. He gets rid of them all. They were eager to stone her. I, do you realize, you notice the text said, they all had their stones in their hand. While Jesus was drawing in the sand, they're picking up stones. They're inside the temple. Now, the temple doesn't have stones just scattered laying around. They brought them with them. They brought them with them. They had prepared in advance. It was all part of the scheme that they were going to take her down to take Jesus down. See what's going on here? They were eager to stone her, but Jesus is eager to save her. He's eager to say, I will take your sin and I will bear it in my body on the cross, on the tree. I will die for you and I'm asking you to receive my gift of life and just turn away from your lifestyle of sin because it is your sin that's going to put me on the cross. How can you any longer live in that which puts me on the cross? He's eager to save her. They were quick to condemn her, and he is quick to forgive her, to release it, let it go, hold it no longer accountable for it. He's quick to forgive her. The question is this, where are your accusers? Every now and then I run into somebody who says, my life is so bad, my, I, you just don't know, Pastor, how terrible life I've had. God could never forgive me. The question is, who are your accusers? You know, who are your accusers? God, there's no sin so great that God will not forgive it. There's just none. Here's the bottom line. For God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come in. Some people got this image of God and Christ. They got this bolt of lightning waiting for you to, to mess up so he can whoosh, nail you with it. And they live in fear every single day that God is out to get me. This passage says, God is not out to get you. God did not send us into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He wants to save you from all that goes with the condemnation. The very... See, Jesus doesn't want to condemn you. Jesus doesn't condemn you. A little later in the same passage, it says this, whoever believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned when you place your faith in Jesus. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of, the, uh, of God's one and only Son. Listen, Jesus doesn't condemn you. You condemn yourself. You condemn yourself. Salvation has been provided you either receive it and are not condemned, or you reject it and you condemn yourself. Christianity is not about us condemning people. We're all condemned already. Christianity is about saving people. What kind of people? Condemned people. Freeing them, let them go. Experience the forgiveness and the grace of God. In another gospel, Jesus said this, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Today I learned some sad news. A mega church pastor has been asked to uh, turn in his resignation. He's been terminated uh, within our region of the state because of adultery. And my heart grieves, and my first question I ask is, are they pursuing restoring, or are they just trying to condemn a man? Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. You see, we, the lesson here is, 
we are to follow in his steps. So when you're going to hear in the news about this pastor that has fallen, it is that we don't jump on it and spread gossip and say, oh, I wonder what... Blah, 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 blah. We should stop and pray and say, God, Satan has had a victory here. Turn the evil into good. Like with Joseph, you meant it to me for evil, but God meant it for good. Protect the family. Protect the wife. Protect the kids. Protect the church. Christianity is not about shooting our wounded. Because we're all wounded. We're all wounded. Christianity is not about condemning those who mess up. We all mess up. Christianity is about being gracious and restoring the fallen, the hurt. Applying the salvation, redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ to build back up and restore and to forgive. That's what Christianity is about. So where are your accusers? That's the question. Where, that, that's, that's, I guess, the real question. The real accuser, the only accuser, is the one you're looking at in the mirror. You accuse. You condemn yourself. What are you going to do? You're going to receive the grace of the Lord Jesus. And then he says, go and sin no more. Get rid of that lifestyle. Let that one go. Start all over. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Zero. Zip. Zilch. There's none. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We stand not guilty in Jesus Christ, clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Just like that woman back then. You can be in that place too. No matter who is accusing you. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. But you've got to be in Christ Jesus. Make him your Savior, your Lord. And then you are not condemned. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is a powerful passage tells us that we are not to be condemning, but always trying to reach out and save someone. Jesus, who was the only sinless one and could condemn, did not condemn. Not her, nor us. We need the Savior. Every one of us. Every day, we mess up. And we just need to throw ourselves on the mercy and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that he is open and ready to forgive, to love, to pardon, to acquit, to build back into our lives. And so, Lord, daily, may we make it our effort to no longer live in a life of sin. We all know which one is our easy sin that trips us up every day. Help us put a precautionary measure so that we don't do that and we leave the life of sin and trust in the true and living God. Bless us now in this time we pray. Amen.